from the Gothic Quarter in Barcelona. This is Market Movers, the podcast that gives you a closer look at the financial markets to trade responsibly. Here are your hosts, Lior Cohen and Yohai Elam. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us and spreading the good word. This is episode number 114, recorded on Friday, August 12th. I'm your coach, Lior Cohen, and joining me, he broke the world record in this year's Olympics in talking about Forex. Yochai Ilam, how's it going, Yochai? Hi, Lior. Yeah, we'll do our best uh, during the, the summer games to keep you entertained with uh, not so much that's going on in Forex, but still interesting. Yeah, still interesting. It's not uh, as uh, creative uh, dancing or something or dressage that we have, they have in the Olympics. Never but forget the dressage. Don't forget the dressage. Yeah, whatever you do with your horse, it's your own business, <laughs> but this is the Olympics. So we'll try to see what's going on in the markets. Uh, this week, we'll tackle the US economic data. What's new about that? Fed's forecasting fail, New Zealand central bank uh, rate cut and market reaction and a preview for the main events of the week. So we haven't talked about the NFP report from last week, but since it's been a week, we can uh, just put it to bed, but at least let's try uh, to tangle it together with the retail sales because the NFP was so good and the retail sales wasn't so where the economy is heading and how does it impact uh, you know the US dollar and uh, if it's policy and all that so wherever you want to start with that well uh, you have a lot of explaining to do Yuhai. well it basically balances everything out everything so, balances well, out yeah uh, for the record i was mostly correct with the nfp forecast two weeks ago mm, i told you right. 150 and it came out 255 yeah so um, yeah that's spot on man okay total guess anyway we had a good non from payroll so we just rose 0.3 255,000 jobs gained uh, positive revisions higher participation rate all good US dollar strengthened, then there was some profit taking, then the US dollar strengthened again, and then came retail sales flat on the headline, drops on the, on the various core figures, control group uh, was flat as well, X gas as well. X autos fell. Bad news. Both are top tier figures, NFP and retail sales. They bounced off each other. If anybody was thinking after last week's NFP that we're going to have a rate hike in September, then of course it's it's gone. Yeah. So now I think if I look at uh, Fed Watch, then it seems that the market anticipate uh, the chances of a rate hike. Uh, it's somewhere around the. Uh, 52%, 54%, something around that number for December. So, yeah, that's possible. Who knows? Yeah, Probably. so it basically is still around a coin flip. It's a coin toss at this point, yeah. as it was, I think, for, for a long time now. Yeah, and you mentioned December, and I want to take that point. It's just after the US elections, and this is the primary reason, I think, regardless of economic data, the Fed will not hike in September. So in December, who knows? The economy can go up and down, down and up several times, uh, assuming uh, everything will be okay, and Clinton wins. They're sort of continuation. Where do you think? You still think that people are penciling in the possibility of a rate hike in September? No, after the NFP, I've seen a few uh, banknotes saying that uh, that's possible. I, I didn't understand why, but... Uh, yeah, because but, they're shifting, as we talked about in uh, one of the previous episodes, that the Fed is also a little bit too on the handle when it comes to data points and whenever they see a good NFP report, then following an F FOMC statement or the minutes or ELN speech comes out a little bit more uh, hawkish. And then there is a, a little bit less, uh, less dis more disappointing NFP report or something like retail sales not uh, meeting expectations. Then we see a little bit more hawkish, for, uh, a little bit more dovish statements from the Fed. So it seems like the Fed is a little bit on the trigger a little bit too much and maybe that's why we're seeing also economists and market participants and pundits like us trying to sort it out and revise the expectations on a day-to-day -day basis, day-by-day well, -day basis. We, we all need something to talk about, right? Exactly, especially on the Olympics now, so... Yeah, uh, so... <laughs> Uh, talking about the Olympics and uh, things that are going on in the background while well, these figures are coming out and also in Ukraine and Russia there is some tension there so watch out for stories that aren't watched by everybody else but went on a tangent there but anyway what I want to say is uh, that the Fed actually hasn't changed interest rates since December so it changes its mood swings in the statements a bit up a bit down but in terms of doing stuff it isn't doing anything so yeah, yeah it's pretty much yeah so that's also brings us to what we what I 
I talked uh, what I alluded to in the beginning of the show about a Fed's forecasting fail. And we're talking about with reference to Bernanke and he just released a blog post about whether or not the Fed is a uh, changing his, uh, its outlook and uh, the specifically the title was uh, the, sh the Fed's uh, shifting perspective on the economy and its, implica and its implications uh, for monetary policy. Yeah, long title and not saying too much. Yeah. Also, the article is quite long. <laughs> yeah, it's a really and, uh, long. We read it for you guys, so you don't have to yeah, go through that. Yeah, I must say I lost the plot at some point, but luckily you didn't and there were some interesting observations there. Yeah, so it seems as if the Fed, he basically says that the Fed hasn't changed much. It's, um, you know, the way he thinks, the way the Fed participants think about the economy. They still, they didn't throw everything out of the window. They're just adjusting to what uh, new economic data uh, show us. And currently they show that uh, unemployment is continuing to come down. Output is going at, uh, growth is going at slower pace, mostly, but not solely because of a slack that there is in a productivity growth. And it's really disappointing. And they're just revising their outlook. So that's why we are, that's why they have revised down their outlook about the cash rate. It was just to remind you, the long term cash rate of the Fed was back in December of 2012 was at 4%. That's what they expected it'll be the long term. And now the, uh, the most recent uh, recent meeting in uh, June, when they revise it, it uh, went down to 3%. Yeah, so, it's something that we don't usually talk about, don't notice that much because it's the long term. We're looking for the next rate hike or the next six to 12 months, but that's that's quite a shift, especially if the interest rate back in the pre-crisis years in 2006-07 was above 5%. So exactly. if they're forecasting now a peak of 3%. That's what's going to be in the an, long run. That's, the a, long that's run. like in steady state when the Fed, the Fed's monetary policy is neutral, i.e. it means that they're not stimulating or causing a, you know, a sluggishness in the economy. They're just letting the economy just run smoothly without trying to stimulate, uh, stimulate it. So under these conditions, they think the long term will be only 3%. And as I said, back in the 20, even as uh, back in 2013, it was also around the uh, 4% and it started to bring it down in 2014 and uh, 2015 and also this year. So they see that the long run rate will be much lower than it is, than it, they thought initially. And it also means that the current cash rates, which is uh, still really low, it's still accommodating, it's still stimulating the economy, but stimulating less considering that the long run is uh, is starting to come to close the gap with what the current interest rate is. So, so I usually see the, these forecasts, I mean, if they are pushed down as, as a dovish message to markets, but according to Bernanke, as, as you explained to me for the show, this could, this downgrade of forecast could make the Fed's policy actually more hawkish, right? Yeah, I mean, in a way, we can look at it as if the Fed is, uh, because long-term rates are coming lower, coming down, at least what Fed participants uh, think it'll, it'll be, then it seems as if the Fed is also uh, becoming a little bit more hawkish considering they haven't changed interest rates, so the cash rates, the, uh, the short term. So, and I think that it also brings about to where, to one of the other uh, points that Bernanke made and basically says, you know what, just forget about what Fed participants are saying. They're not going to tell you much. If you want to know what's going on, just look at the data. And this is something I think the market is pretty much on board with that and has been for a while we're seeing it from the fed from the fed watch uh, what they assume what the market anticipates the cash rate will be because fed officials are continued try, trying to persuade us hey we're gonna september is a live meeting come on and you know we can still raise rates even in november don't don't rule us out and the oh, you wouldn't we, expect them to say anything else but. yeah obviously they have to do that but bernanke say come on guys not useless <laughs> yeah <laughs> don't rule us out completely because they want to have the option of raising rates in case there's going to be such a development of a higher inflation but it seems like it's not going to happen bernanke say hey you you want to know what's going on just look at the data 
that's your best uh, estimate of where the Fed is heading. The Fed is not, is uh, anticipating lower rates. They're anticipating that this is the new norm. So it's not, they're not going to raise rates substantially higher than what they are now and it'll take a much longer pace until they reach this uh, so, elusive three percent rate if at all so what he's basically saying and what also maybe others have be begun saying is that the fed doesn't the forecasting abilities of the fed are gone there's in theory they're supposed to be ahead of the curve forecasting and and taking measures to to mitigate to slow down or, or steaming up of the economy but what he's saying is basically uh what we know is only the past not the future mm -hmm. uh nobody knows the future but they have yeah just like yogi their... berra used to say it's like uh, forecasting is really hard especially of the future yeah so, so... <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a little bit harsh to do, and the Fed is uh, shows us uh, why it's really hard to do that because they also have been revising down their outlook about uh, GDP growth, unemployment. But what about the fact that monetary policy? I mean, we still think about it as something that takes time to reach the real economy, right? So if uh, the economy is slowing down and the Fed cuts interest rates, then this will be felt positively within six months, a year two years, three years, the medium term, and the other way around. When they raise interest rates, it's to mitigate future inflation. I mean, something that now seems to belong to the past as well. But anyway, so does it mean now that their policy, if it's based only on recent hard data of the past and not the future, does it mean that they also expect monetary policy to have an immediate impact or? Well, it seems as if they don't really expect that there's going to be much of a change at least when you look at at least they want to see some improvement in key factors that that are still sluggish i mean okay unemployment is really low wages are starting to pick up but we're still seeing very low and subdue inflation we're still seeing that the productivity the growth rate of productivity is still uh, coming down so and that's also one of the key factors in slowing down the growth of the u.s economy and they want to see something about that investments are still also uh, uh, nowhere to be seen. Uh, we saw when we talked about in the last GDP report also, that was really disappointing yeah. figures and the Fed is watching it. And that's what he also says, uh, Bernanke also refers to that. So he also, when it comes to when they're gonna raise rates, he's also starting to be, start to sound a little bit more like Krugman and not that they weren't in the same uh, box, they were both doves, but you know, like Krugman was a uh, Uber dove and, uh, and Bernanke yeah. was a regular dove, let's put it this way. So it seems like uh, Bernanke is also seems to quote this, uh, not quote, but uh, refer to, inadvertently refer to Krugman as, uh, yeah, they should raise rates when they see, you know, the, the inflation uh, right up uh, up their alley like there it really is coming about and not only the forecast of inflation it means they've given up on forecast because they cannot they'll believe it only when they see it exactly and only they, when they see it they should actually start raising rates at, at least and according in classic to bernanke. monetary policy theory that in that moment will be too late but according to bernanke it will not be too late because they well first of all they can't forecast anything and uh well that it's not that yeah it, it wasn't maybe that too harsh but he did refer that they have like a lot of uh, forecasting errors and maybe that's also one of the reasons for why they've revised down their uh, outlook at least for the cash rate they also it also refers to what the fed should actually be doing and um, it seems as maybe he also referred to buller that maybe you know what just don't try to forecast because you can't well B bullard admitted at some point that if you would have listened to him would have lost a lot of money right? <laughs> exactly i mean listen to his forecast specifically refer to his own forecast so um... so yeah maybe they should uh, yeah maybe you know what maybe they should also just uh, start just stick, stick to the facts they could still a forecast but it seems like their models aren't too accurate and they have some some problems they have to figure well, it out the world is changing economy is changing and data well in the internet age data is flowing rapidly and the western world is has moved out of manufacturing a long time ago and into services technology is advancing population is aging i mean many things have changed so i guess it's also time to revise the models of the fed or or as bernanke offers just give up on forecasting yeah and just look at 
um, just look at the numbers and see if you see that the numbers are are good and we're starting to see some inflation maybe then they should start to revise start to raise rates and uh, should look at that so just look at the data and i think next week there are the cpi so maybe that'll be a little bit more of another data point to collect yeah to the it, whole issue but you'll have to wait for a few a few recurring months of rising in inflation also in their own core pc price index before they'll begin thinking about another move according to again bernanke which uh, who offers uh yeah, what do you say about uh, Bernanke's uh, perspective on it? And he has, you know, like he has the prime uh, view, uh, specifically as someone who has been there and also now that he's not there. So he has a little bit more perspective on both sides. Well, he personally did, well, like most economists did not foresee the financial crisis. So... <laughs> Yeah, that is true. But yeah, even though he was a scholar of this uh, financial crises, that was his field of interest. But yeah, still. had had he been parachuted into the Fed in September 2008 and begun his policy then, I would say he's a hero. I mean, only a hero, 100% hero, but he's been there since 2006 as chair. And years beforehand, I think he had made his career at the Fed. So, well, of course, that's a whole different episode. But you can see him either as someone who was blind to the crisis or someone who, who did a lot afterwards. Mm. History will <laughs> History will tell, yeah. And All right. it's still too soon because we're still in the 2008 crisis in, in many ways, despite yeah. seven well, years of recovery. Yeah, and when you look at it, I mean, Carney, he did you know, step up to the plate just like Draghi did. And they're, both of them are trying, you know, to be a little bit more accommodating and uh, just to provide more, as much stimulus as possible. And at least for now, it seems that at least for the for the pound and for the euro, it, it did some some good. But yeah. besides that, when it comes to inflation, there are still nowhere to be seen. No, maybe they'll get some inflation now in the UK with the falling pound. I'll say another positive word about uh, Carney as yes, the governor of the the Bank of Canada, he cut interest rates early in 2008 at the same time when Trichet was raising rates. So uh, he definitely, well, in comparison to many of his peers in the developed world, he, he at least foresaw some of the crisis he had. Mm. Well, to compare Carney to Trichet is like, uh, I don't know, comparing you riding, running like to the one who will win the Olympics running, I think, no? Basically. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a very good runner. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not a pro. Yeah, yeah so I think Nobody that's... Nobody pays me. Yeah, so that's pretty Trichet much it. Trichet was paid top dollar. Top, top dollar, hero. but he wasn't a pro also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it. All right, so and let's look, let's move to way, way, way the other way around to the world in New Zealand. There was a little bit of a stir up over there. What what was uh, going on over there, Yochai? Suddenly we're listening about not a uh, Hobbit related news coming from uh, New Zealand. Yeah, so in the middle of the winter there, actually. So the the economy is a bit slowing down. Inflation is a bit low. Interest rate. Nobody's drinking milk. High. Nobody's drinking no, milk. No, it's, uh... Milk is doing okay, actually. In the last auction, it, milk prices jumped 6.6%. The economy in general is okay. Also in Australia, they're selling to Asia and it's okay. Interest rates are still not zero. After this recent cut, they fell to 2%. But they did uh, up for some uh, microprudential tools to calm down the housing market, in, especially in Auckland. So they had the chance to cut rates to weaken the currency, to help exports and to lift other types of inflation, not housing inflation. All in all, not such an interesting story. It's a developed economy, but it's a small country of, I think, 5 million people. The interesting story for me was that they telegraphed this rate cut, perhaps gave us too much information that we had more than the usual buy the rumor, sell the fact uh, reaction. We had, they cut the rates by 25 basis points as expected, didn't take Maybe some, they made markets hungry for even 50 basis points, but they did hint about another rate cut this year and, and future ones to come. And they did uh, say that there's a relationship between their monetary policy and the exchange rate. That means they're watching closely uh, FX markets. You would expect the Kiwi to fall, yeah, but that didn't happen. We had a jump of about 1%. So what gives? I think that you're the pundit. You have to explain yeah. to us. Come yeah, on. So you're I the guy with all the explanations. Perhaps uh, it's the Kiwi in the coal mine, if you wish. That <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that uh, central banks are we actually we've seen that a bit in Japan that they're unable to satisfy the market's hunger and they, they have less influence perhaps on markets. Well, we did see Carney 
did have some influence, but something uh, something is changing in, in, in the behavior of markets. More take more taking risk, more volatility. What is yeah, more? nothing is enough. Sort of uh, maybe the maybe forward guidance will. Uh, we had more and more transparency in the past years. Maybe we'll have a setback in that. Maybe central bankers will prefer surprising markets. We've seen failures in communication from Japan, from uh, Draghi, and now from also New Zealand. I think it was the most important country, but the strongest example of how it's never enough and uh, perhaps too much of the move was priced in and the markets always want too much. So I think... Uh, so the market think... uh, anticipated a little bit more stimulus, like a, uh, like a substantial more of a rate cut than what the New Zealand uh, central bank... Perhaps uh, more, more rate cut, uh, more gloomy picture. I don't know, but something isn't working for, uh, for central bankers. It seems like if you're not surprising with something out of left field that nobody expected, then it's not going to work, basically. Yeah. So I think we'll, uh, we'll see forward guidance being pushed back. <laughs> yeah, so that's what we back also guidance. saw in BOJ, right? I mean, the BOJ also tried to provide the stimulus. In that but... case, there were more rumors and reports rather than... I mean, the, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand had a special publication of a report in which basically they talked about rate cut. We didn't see that in Japan. There was just talk about more stimulus in the background. Expectations after the elections, it was not that straightforward. So correlates back to uh, what we said before about uh, the Fed not being able to forecast. So I think central banks will, like perhaps Bullard suggested, will provide less forward guidance and try to surprise markets, keep us a bit more, keep us in the dark and trigger a bigger impact from, from their actions when they act and not from uh, their hints. Mm. What, what do you think? Well, I haven't uh, paid too close of attention to New Zealand. Sorry about that. But yeah, I didn't pay too much of close of attention, but it's very, it was, I remember it really was, took the uh, uh, headlines about it. Do you think it had also something to do with what, uh, you know, the Reserve uh, Central Bank of Australia did because they also cut rates and maybe it also a little bit, I don't know, mitigated their New Zealand's impact. I mean, they're they're not similar economies, but they are still in the whole, you know, same yeah, region, yeah. and there are some. They're still both of them really heavily yeah. rely on China. We, we do see sometimes the New Zealand dollar getting carried away after the Australian dollar, either positively or negatively, and the fact that the RBA cut rates added to the expectations that the RBNZ will follow, that New Zealand will follow Australia in, in cutting rates. So it also contributed to expectations. But, and of course, low inflation, I mean, the, the hard data, like we said about the Fed. But for me, it was striking that they, I mean, told us that there's going to be a rate cut. And uh, when they, when the news actually came, <clears throat> it was for me more than a regular buy the rumor, sell the fact response, but uh, sort of um, markets uh, saying, we're going the other direction. We don't care. <laughs> Mm. Especially as, as they said, Graham Wheeler, the governor of the RBN, said, said that there's a connection between the exchange rate and their monetary policy. That means Kiwi will rise more. I mean, if few markets push the New Zealand dollar higher, we'll do more rate cuts, weaken it. So the market said, nah, we don't care. Mm. All right. Okay. So let's turn to what's up ahead for next week, you high? Uh, there are not going to be any rate hikes or cuts next week, right? Or... Uh, no, not that I know of. Not that you know of. All right, <laughs> so let's uh, take it in order. Let's starting with uh, Monday this time. Yeah, we have uh, a Japanese GDP. Should be a market mover, especially as uh, market volume will probably be low because it's a vacation in some European countries and there aren't too many other events going on at the same time. So it's a preliminary release for Q2 and we're expecting continued growth in Japan albeit at a weaker level 0.2%. Then we have actually next week the main feature, there are two big events, the Fed meeting minutes, well, could turn into a snoozer and perhaps the bigger event, it's a release of uh, UK related data, hard data for July. So far we had the forward looking soft mm, data. The first uh, data point for uh, after yeah. post Brexit world. Yeah, so it begins with uh, inflation, perhaps a bit 
less important, but let's see if the weaker pound pushed prices higher. We should say all the figures are for July. All the figures are 100% post Brexit. Okay, so we have also Brexit related is the German uh, zoo indicator because it fell to negative territory last time in July as a reaction to the Brexit. Now it should bounce back according to expectations. We have inflation, as I said, in the UK. In the US, uh, we have the inflation figures as well. On uh, Tuesday, as we said before, not too much to expect out of that. No, nothing? Well, they're released together with housing data. So if both housing figures, housing starts and building permits, as well as inflation figures all go up or all together, they go down, could have an impact, but usually these numbers offset each other. I mean, the housing figures offset each other. Inflation does not provide big surprises. Who knows? Maybe this time we'll be lucky. Uh, we have continuing on the New Zealand theme, we have employment figures from New Zealand, but they already released their labor costs. So it's well, it's still important. It's still only once a quarter in New Zealand. They are not quick to release figures over there. <laughs> well, they take their sweet time. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Um, going back to the UK, we have the jobs report. This could be a bit confusing because the jobless claims, the claimant count changes for July. So let's see if the economy lost jobs. Mm. But then employment... Yeah, it's probably too, still too soon, no? Uh, probably, but who knows? And employment figures, uh, sorry, the unemployment rate and wages are for June. That means pre-Brexit. But we have the Fed meeting minutes. It could be more interesting than last time because uh, the last me minutes, because it's for a meeting that did not consist of press conference or, or fresh forecast. So let's see if the Fed gives us a hint. Probably it'll be on one hand, on the other hand, on one hand, on the other hand. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it, it so basically, mean, just remember Bernanke when you're trying to uh, look at what the Fed minutes were. Yeah, basically, we don't know. Or as Carney said, high level of uncertainty. Exactly. Well, I, all of them say that. No? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, quite of a theme over going on over there among central bankers. Right. We have Australian uh, employment figures also next week, uh, but these are monthly, not like the Kiwi ones, which are quarterly. And the biggest, the most important UK release, I believe, is retail sales on Thursday. Uh, we'll see if consumers actually reacted, not if they were expected to react in forward looking data, but if they actually. Oh, this is for than, July? This is for July. 100% post Brexit. Closely watched. Expectations that I see now are for a minimal rise after, well, there are some seasonal things. Uh, the drop in, in June of 0.9% was blamed on the football, the uh, Euro matches. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, so this time it's... It, it'll uh, be blamed on something else, but if it'll be bad, it'll be Brexit related. Brexit related bad. Brexit blame, yeah. Yeah, all right. A uh, speech by Bill Dudley, number two at the Fed on Thursday, could be more interesting than the meeting minutes or not. Maybe they'll keep their ammunition for the Jackson Hole Symposium. And that's about it. I mean, we do have uh, Canadian retail sales and CPI on Friday, but basically it's a summer Friday. So, uh, I mean, the bigger economies. So Everybody are just going to the beach, yeah. basically. Yeah. Watching oh. the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, oh, that's true. That's also a good thing to do. Okay, that's it. That's our show. Thank you as usual, Yuhai. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. If you like our show, give us a five star ratings on iTunes and you can subscribe to the show via Stitcher, email, RSS, or iTunes. Whatever suits you fancy. So until next week, this is Dior signing up for Yuhai saying have a great week and invest responsibly. This podcast should be used for educational, research, and informational purposes only and does not constitute investment advice. There are no guarantees expressed or implied of future positive returns in regard to the subject matter contained herein. Understand the risks inherent in investing before making the decision to invest or consult an investment professional for more information. A reasonable due diligence has been performed in regards to the information in this podcast. However, the hosts and guests of this podcast expressly disclaim any liability for accidental omissions of information or errors in fact. For comments, suggestions, and questions, visit the podcast page at forexcrunch.com or tradingnrg.com, where you can also find past episodes and subscribe to the show. Our listeners make market movers possible.